know our guest quite well enough. Um, is there any way for us to hear the people at, um, no, nobody? They can't talk? I need relationships like that. How can I get one? Anybody help me with that? Okay, it is a great pleasure for me to introduce Bill Litton. Um, this is gonna take a little bit. I'm not gonna do the Michael Friedlander introduction because I cannot, Michael Friedlander is um, famous, infamous, and notorious for his introductions. They're often summaries of people's work that the people didn't realize that they had done. They're really incredible. Because they hadn't done it? Well, I mean, they're incredible in their completeness. Synoptic. Yeah, and their synthesis, and it's like a, it's an avocation for him. Um, I think the faculty here, would you agree with that, Michael? Yeah, I would. I mean, they're amazing. I would, you know, if you need a, 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 an upper, um, you should get Mike to introduce you for anything. If you need a downer, get me to get up here. Um, uh, Bill uh, went to Harvard um, as an undergraduate and studied chemistry and graduated magna cum laude and went to uh, Columbia Medical School. And then after that, ironically, um, went to um, UAB as an intern, I guess, as a, as a proper intern. Um, there's a story about why he went to UAB, and then he came back to, I guess, Columbia to finish up residency. He's a, neuro he's a neurologist. He's really a neuroscientist uh, of an interesting sort. I met Bill as a, um, he had moved to the Salk Institute with Terry Sinalski and Jenny Giles and uh, Shona Chatterjee from the biophysics department at Hopkins. Richard Adams. Richard Adams. We, we, we did meet when I visited. I was there. I was there. So uh, there are two ironies then. So I was a medical student at UAB when apparently you were a resident, but I was a medical student, you know, on my way out of the MSTP program and on to whatever it is I became. Um, I think Bill was there just to see how things worked on the edge of, uh, the, edge of the edge of civilization. Go to Hopkins and they said, no, as close as you can go is Alabama. Okay. So. Uh, but, but the, the interesting part and the, and the place that we overlap is, um, is not just geographically, but uh, conceptually and in a new area that was um, nascent and emerging at the time. We were in a lab that was funded by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. It was called the Computational Neurobiology Lab. It was at the Salk Institute, and I think you were probably the first fellow of that group. Sydney Lackey, came out of the closet, literally, not Sydney Lackey. Oh, so I know the whole crew. So Sidney Lecky was a, an early innovator in using neural networks to work on perceptual problems. His a famous work was in shape from shading and whatnot. And back in those days, neural networks, unlike today, where there's a fever because they can do everything from recognize pictures to drive cars, um, they kind of couldn't do anything. Okay, so the idea that there were a whole bunch of people, physicists and mathematicians and quantitative neuroscientists working on computational substrates of cognition and perception in a group was really an outlier. And it's, 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 it's never been clear to me exactly why the Howard Hughes invested in it, but they basically started computational neuroscience by investing in that. Between there and Caltech, was everyone um, went out and, and the... Right. Backprop's not really going to be the brain. And now backpropagation as a training algorithm is, um, you know, beating the game of Go, the world champions. Anyway, Bill's interest, which is different than the trajectories you'll see. I'm, so this is going to take a little bit um, from others. And then, then we have your, your current claim to fame. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, <clears throat> has been in the, one of the problems that plagues understanding the nervous system. And it would be a problem if we didn't, for computers if we didn't understand how computers work. So suppose you were given a computer and didn't know anything about how it worked. And we're trying to do everything from biochemistry and molecular physiology, let's say at the scale of transistors and P and P junctions and semiconductors, all the way up to the fact that computer programs uh, send you your check at the end of the month and control the temperature in this room, okay? Suppose, 
you didn't know exactly from which of the many, many levels between the transistors and the program that's controlling the temperature in here, the perceptual experience of being cool or the right temperature, the software was emerging. What would you do? Well, it's a multi-scale problem. There are many, many levels that contribute to it, but they contribute in different ways. And many, many of the levels, if you had a guess that there was a software layer in between the things that are keeping the ones and zeros straight and doing error checking on that, there's a software layer, and it does X, Y, and Z. And on top of this software layer is another software layer, and it can basically ignore the one beneath it as long as the one beneath it is implementing things right. Now imagine you take that system and you make it sick at different levels. You poison some of the PNP junctions in the semiconductors. You don't quite make the chips right. You don't make the control software exactly perfect on board the chip. Or maybe you write a, uh, a Python or an R program at the top level here, and it has an error in it, but it's a hard error to detect. Every now and then it's wrong and not all the time. Okay, that's a hard problem. That's the problem in the nervous system. The other problem in the nervous system is it's been evolving for a long, long time. And people like me, and I think people like Bill, much to his credit and what he's studied and the, kind of the discipline course that he has followed through the years, is that there's a lot of tricks in the tissue. And we really haven't dug these things out yet. And modeling efforts are going to have to take this thing at multiple levels simultaneously. In many ways, that's what the Biocomplexity Institute at um, VT was directed at, multi-scale heterogeneous processes. We don't know how to think about them. There may be software exists within layers and across layers. Um, so it's a tricky problem. And in the modern world, we could say, well, we're going to throw the whole problem away now. We're going to throw neural networks in the sort of behavioral space, and that's going to explain everything. And I think that's wrong. I think, in fact, we're in an age where we can handle a lot of data, and we should go get a lot of data. In other words, I think we don't really quite have the data yet to connect perceptual sciences deeply with what we would call neurobiology. neurobiology. Those, those things that we're still trying to press those things in on one another. And I think you'll see from Bill's talk, I don't know exactly what he'll talk about, but I know what his publications look like, um, an effort to kind of move uh, up and down from the middle. And so <clears throat> with that, that's his academic introduction. He also holds the record. F um, and here, the only speaker that we've ever had that has, within the last 12 months, been attacked by a great white shark and survived to tell about it. Um, he was, uh, when were you attacked? Uh, last August, August, 15th. August 15th, attacked by a great white shark off Cape Cod, north coast. Um, survived it. And um, but we already had the invite on, right? I mean, it was part of that that kept you going, right? The idea that you were going to come here and speak. Here, so I had to survive. Yeah. Anyway, uh, well, that's quite a moniker. And um, so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it off to you, and, and welcome to our speaker, Bill Litton. Yeah, so I'll just uh, mostly echo a lot. So it was good. That was synoptic. Uh, echo a lot of what we just heard here from Reed. Um, I wanted to I'm just try to remember the thing somehow sticks in my mind, because I was impressed by your humility. Uh, oddly enough, which is not something you think of when you think of Reed, but it's good for the for the for the people who look for jobs because Reed came to the uh, Sinyovsky lab and was looking for a position, and uh, because it started raining, he and I raced to where we had to go for dinner, and I won, and it made me feel good. It made me feel like, hey, I'm faster than this guy. who used to run track, and then something like not only he run track, but he's like a uh, uh, athletic champion, he's decathlete, and the time, a couple times we tried to work out together, it was clear he let me win. And that's because he's humble and he knows if you want to get a job, make the other guy look good. So that was very good, good lesson for me because then I subsequently went on to try to get a job and I, I used that, I think. <laughs> so uh, talk about the idea of looking at some of the details of neurons and not just a question already. It's so time. It was 15.11 now, but that's OK. I can still, I can still give the same talk. <laughs> um, OK, so having clarified that, uh, the, the details of neurons, I am thinking, guessing, assuming, believing, religiously almost, are very important in our eventual understanding of the nervous system. 
And this just this picture, I think, from Cajal or Lorente de No, where he's looking at different kinds of cells. A bunch of them are Purkinje cells from different organisms, uh, some kind of pyramidal cell here. This is one of these, maybe a Martinati cell. Uh, and thinking about, well, what the heck are these doing? And the bottom line is we still don't know what the heck they're doing a century plus two decades later. So uh, I think this is the key problem. And uh, it's unfortunately obscured by this fantastic success of backprop and deep learning, where you have this very simplified idea of what a neuron does. And you can do fantastic things with it. But you, know, you can't really drive a robot that well. You can do go. So this is this uh, quote which was brought out in the Obama Brain Project, gets uh, 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 repeated. And that is that we don't really just need new ideas. Of course, we always need new ideas this idea of the paradigm shift, we really need some data to work with. And until you have the data, until you have something to work with, data-driven, it's a term, uh, you don't get very far. And so the example I was trying to remember earlier today with Reed, maybe somebody remembers this name, there's some famous Greek philosopher scientist who begins with an A and is not Archimedes and is not Aristotle. Anybody? Anyway, he came up with the idea, this might help, if, uh, that the Earth was at the center, was not at the center, the Sun was at the center, and the Earth would go around it. And that was a really cool idea. And it turns out much later to have been a really good idea. But nobody was going to believe that crap because there's no data. And so even when Copernicus comes around, nobody's going to believe that nonsense, except suddenly, coincidentally it seems, well, part of the Renaissance, there's data that says, hey, the stuff we've been doing, the way Ptolemy looked at things, is not working out. We've got these phases of the moons of Venus. I think that was a big deal. That's not right. The moons of somewhere. And we have uh, phases of Venus, actually, phases of Venus. And we have uh, all these, these, these data points that just really cannot fit in. So Kepler and Galileo and telescopes was the new technology made it possible to change your mind. Otherwise, you could change your mind all you want. You can imagine whatever you want, but you can't get anywhere with it unless you have some data. So my talk outline is a slightly, not quite backwards, but slightly inside out. And the reason is because I'm a unmarian, a dismartian. I'm not a fan of David Marr. People know who David Marr is. He is a very famous early computational neuroscientist who said that the way to understand the brain is to first understand the problems the brain is having, the problem of vision, the problem of how to change a two-dimensional view on the retinas of three dimensions out there, and then to work out algorithms, and then to work out implementation. Well, my view is we need to understand what the neuron does. We need to work out the implementation, and that's part of what you were saying, and that having worked out the implementation, I then would like to take the then this is kind of middle out, then take the problems, many problems, that different parts of the brain have different problems, and think about now squeezing down how can we develop, think about algorithms that would use these techniques, which are entirely different from the techniques you use with PNP, NPN transistors, to get something to work in uh, doing all the things the brain has to do. So I'm going to start out with implementation in terms of what we do implementation-wise, which is developing technology for simulation, uh, which I feel is also needed, not just technology for actually looking at things, but technology for how you're going to be able to understand those things through simulation and modeling. Uh, talk about a particular model that we've done uh, uh, here of M1, primary motor cortex, and then come back and talk about the problem, which is kind of computational neuroscience as a field, as being somewhat lost and uh, wandering and about to drop into the big hole of deep learning for another decade. Um, and then talk again about dendrites and something specific here in terms of a model that we've developed. Uh, of course, I'm open to questions, comments, et cetera, as we go along. So if people don't know something like who Dave Marr is, in this case, I caught the like possibility you might not know, uh, please ask. Or if anybody comes up with the name of that Greek scientist. No, no, okay. I'm gonna look it up later, then I'll have it. So we wrote this paper recently, NetPine, which is our program, really written by Salvador. <laughs> Salvador Dura Bernal did all the work here, and uh, with a big team of people who contributed a tool for data-driven multi-scale modeling for brain circuits. Uh, so it is multi-scale. We're trying to get all the way down to molecular levels 
to look at chains of molecular reactions, cascades, how different uh, calcium, how cyclic AMP, how G proteins affect ion channels, which affects electricity, which affects calcium entry, uh, calcium induced calcium release, all this kind of thing down at the molecular level, up as far as the network when we're talking about a network of maybe 10,000, maybe a million cells. Uh, from there, we would like to get up, and we need to think more about this because we don't have, we have some papers on it, but not anything great about how to get to the level of multiple areas, as you guys would be interested in for fMRI or magnetoencephalography. Uh, one of the tasks that we set ourselves and which we succeeded in doing is that it's nice to be able to prototype networks in a small way with what's called integrated fire cells. And again, this is a term of art. Do people know what an integrated fire cell is? It's getting pretty close to being what a deep learning type of cell is. So a deep learning unit or a backprop unit is a sum and squash unit. So you summate all the inputs into it, and then you squash it down to some, with some kind of a sigmoid function. So you end up with a value between 0 and 1 or a value between negative 1 and 1. And the integrated in fire is kind of similar, except that it is a spiking unit, whereas the sum and squash is just a scalar value. The integrated in fire sums up, that's the integrate part, and then generates spikes. And the number of spikes that are generated would be taken in the context of one of these backprop deep learning algorithms as meaning a rate which could be identified with the scalar that you would use in a deep learning application. Uh, this guy Izakevich is very well known. He was uh, also with Edelman. You overlapped with him or he was after you? So he uh, worked with Edelman for years and he was on his, uh, well, and then he was, yeah, moved with Edelman to San Diego and now he runs the Brain Corporation, which originally was going to make spiking cells and, uh, and, cr and um, see how they would work better than standard uh, standard sum and squash cells, but now really he's just working on robotics, I think, for Walmart. <laughs> so he's become a Walmart worker, but he's a very brilliant guy anyway, despite that. Uh, one, single compartment models, a single compartment means basically a Hodgkin-Huxley model. People have seen the Hodgkin-Huxley model for state variables, M, H, N, and voltage, and uh, that shows spiking behavior, uh, and that can be then elaborated into very many different ion channels, multi-compartment model, meaning you have dendrites, which I think is very important, which is why we use a lot of multi-compartment models. However, to just start out, it's nice to be able to use one of these very simplified models so you can run something fast, you don't have to put it on a supercomputer, and then when you get it working, you can throw in the multi-compartment. So to be able to just switch in and out the different types of cells is a feature of NetPine. Uh, we're working on a GUI with the people at uh, a company, Metacell, in England. It's based on the Geppetto architecture. Uh, we have a lot of analysis tools that are there and also an easy transition to putting it on a supercomputer. So that's all tech. So here's more about NetPine. Uh, again, we're trying to sell it. So if anybody's doing simulations, network simulations, and wants to use it, we offer a lot of tutorials, courses, online tutorial, online documentation, et cetera. So the basic ideas are mostly here kind of uh, that we have, it, it's based on Neuron. So Neuron is a simulation program out of Yale. Mike Hines is the developer of that. It's meant uh, primarily as what's a compartmental modeling for multi-compartment models, as I referred to before. And what multi-compartment models are, they take the single compartment, which is Hodgkin-Huxley parallel conductance model, and they string those together with resistors. And so basically you have something that was a cell that you looked at in a microscope, and you then traced it, so you have this diagram of dendrites, and then the dendrites, each piece of dendrite becomes an RC circuit, a resistor capacitor circuit with rheostats. And the rheostats in the hodgkin oxy formulation are voltage sensitive rheostats that change their conductance based on voltage. So we start with those models and also this NeuroML and also now Sonata, which is another type of, uh, uh, of database, which is coming out of Genelia and Human Brain Project, and we throw them into specifications that can be read by a person. They're declarative language, so you don't have to be writing detailed programs. You don't have to write the loops, essentially. Then we can create networks out of these, 
and we can throw them back and forth between serial and parallel, and again, change the cells in and out, run the simulation, uh, do the analysis, and output the analysis in a way that could be read into other simulators as well, such as Nest, or uh, Pine, Brian, Moose, uh, also output that can be read by MATLAB or Excel or other Python packages like Pandas. Uh, so it's a declarative language. This is what it looks like. So you have a bunch of cells you want to simulate. You decide <clears throat> we're going to have these preconditions. So for example, the Y values should be between 100 and 400 microns from the PIA. <coughs> this is a synaptic synapse. It's based on AMPA, which is one of the major glutamatergic synaptic receptors. There's a delay from this presynaptic pre spike to a activation of this AMPA mechanism. Uh, there's a weight. There's a probability of connectivity. And uh, so here between layer two and well, from layer two to itself, to excitatory cells in layer two, here from excitatory cells in layer two to layer five. So it all comes out as being relatively easy to read, relatively easy to export and import and translate into other formats compared to a program, which will have a loops in, embedded in loops, and it'll be difficult. You'd have to read it. It's hard to... to, to Decompile to compile and then decompile into another language. So we try to go among all these levels, as I said. So that really, ideally, down to the biophysical level, including extra, extracellular, extrasynaptic, and cle synaptic cleft simulation, which is not something we've done yet, but something that seems like it's very important. And so we'd like to include that as well. And here's just nice pictures. And also emphasizing the point that when you talk about neurophysiology, everybody thinks neurophysiology is electrophysiology. Everything is electricity. Uh, it's not. There's a lot of chemophysiology. And all of these cascades, and frankly, the, just the way any cell works is extremely complex. And you might think, well, all the cells are very complex, and all the stuff in the nervous system that's doing all those complex cascades is just doing it for its own metabolism. So we don't have to worry about that. A lot of metabolism has been utilized over the, how many years have it been of evolution? Centuries? Decades? A long time. A lot of evolution out there. All that time in making use of all these things that were previously useful for the liver, useful for the kidney, make use of these things for thinking. So it's what's always impressive that you, you think what you eat, right? You're, you're thinking with rotten butter and umami. Right? OK. No questions about rotten butter or umami? All right, good. So moving on. Uh, well, I think everyone assumes that umami is better, glutamate, but we have a paper suggesting you can get better information flow through with rotten butter, GABA. So there, you wouldn't have guessed that. See, major discovery. Just have to wait for someone to test that. All right. So we do this diffusion stuff, uh, extracellular and intracellular. Uh, and uh, we don't do this at all, but we found a picture somewhere, and we wish we could do this. It's, this thing has been, like, harpooned. That's weird. OK, anyway, oh, that's just a release of some transmitter. OK, fine. And uh, we do do this. This is uh, from one of our papers. Just all these different roles of calcium is amazing. And there's a paper by Avrama Blackwell where she says, calcium, the answer to everything. Just when you thought it was 42, it turns out to be calcium. Um, so this is a lot of stuff we'd like to do. Actually, I, I heard, well, a colleague at uh, Rockefeller has a fantastic set of papers and a fantastic talk about just how the nuclear pore works down to the level of modeling. And it's just incredibly complex. And this is something that I kind of barely knew existed, and I have really not a good idea what it does. It's complexity on top of complexity on top of complexity. <gasps> it's frightening. <sighs> just calm down. OK. So uh, we do the analysis, and one of the things we want to do is do structure function relationships. So we do analysis of the simulation, what we put into it, of our data that goes into it, of how the simulation is built. And then we try to say something about, well, what comes out of it based on how we design the network, what kind of cells we use, what kind of dendrites we use, uh, how active the dendrites are, and what the connectivity is. And so we can get simple basic measures that are used all the time in neurophysiology and are really too simple in my view. 
uh, as well as measures of things like oscillations, which I think are more to the point. Um, uh, we map and measure lo local field potentials, and now we've gotten to the point working with a group at Brown, uh, Stephanie Jones' group, where we're also d directly trying to model, uh, we are modeling, uh, and have to see how well we're modeling, MEG and EEG. So we want to understand really what you can, understand things you can measure, not just understand things that we would like to, uh, to that we can readily simulate, because certainly EEG in particular is, is relatively hard to simulate. Uh, again, this GUI is being developed by Metacell. It's, it's really pretty. I'm myself not very much of a GUI person. I'm more a programmer type person, but I can certainly see the appeal of, 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 of pretty pictures, plus it's easier to work with. Um, so uh, that, that's, I think, going to be very important to getting this ad adapted and used by people who, for example, might be doing MEG and EEG primarily and don't want to do any programming. So in, in GUI stuff, GUI stuff. So it's been done now for a variety of models, many of which are out in the literature. So we've taken those models. Sometimes they've been neuron models, so it hasn't required much translation. But sometimes, as in the case of uh, Putchins and Diesemann's famous model of cortex. We've had to take it from what was uh, simulation in NEST, which is this German program, which is kind of our main competitor, I'd say, out of Ulich, Germany. And we had to then port it, or, or some of our colleagues, I think uh, our Brazilian po colleagues, ported that. <coughs> uh, we've done some models with learning, so with reinforcement learning, in particular looking at controlling a robot arm. And um, <coughs> This uh, Stephanie Jones I mentioned, some, ep some simulation uh, for epilepsy as well. So we're trying to broaden. I mean, this, as you can tell, is a bit of a sales talk. We're trying to get more users, get people to use it. Uh, if you send us you know, $500 each time you use it, that would be fine. Or if you don't, that's OK, too, because it's NIH supported. So we don't, we don't charge anything for it. So LFPs can be generated. Pretty pictures can be created. Uh, this picture I liked because it looked like folk dancing. The neurons folk dancing around the dentate gyrus. Can you see that? Can you see that, everybody? Okay, good. All right, that's key. So our main simulation that we've run with this program is our M1 microcircuit. The work, the actual work, was done by Gordon Shepard at Northwestern. So this is Shepard, son of Shepard. The older Shepard is at Yale. He wrote Synaptic Organization of the Brain. It's a very famous, or he edited, it's a very famous book. This is the younger one who, uh, you know, is just a bit younger than me, uh, who, who said, of course, for years and decades, no, I will never do neuroscience. And of course, now he's a prominent neuroscientist doing almost exactly the same work as his dad did. So that just goes to show. Um, and uh, Salvador is the person in my lab who uh, really did all this stuff. And then Ben uh, in Gordon's lab was very instrumental. So what are we simulating? We're simulating a cylinder of tissue nominally something like a micro column, although the notion of a micro column is not well, or even a column is not well defined anatomically. It's really a physiological notion that is lacking, unfortunately, anatomical confirmation, except for the case of the whisker baskets. Uh, we are only simulating about, well, only, it took us a lot of work, so it's a, a lot for us. 10,000 neurons, we'd like to get this up by a factor of 10 or 100. 15 different neuro populations order 3 times 10 to the 7th synapses. So this is the kind of thing that Gordon and Ben measure uh, from mouse. And then we can, uh, you know, they trace a lot of cells. We can put those cells together. And this is quite similar to what the Human Brain Project is trying to do. Um, although I think our, our, added, our efforts are both more and less ambitious than theirs. Uh, we're more connected to the idea of better understanding the dynamics, better connecting the dynamics, the notions of information flow, whereas uh, they are much bigger. A billion euros will buy you a few computers, uh, and that's what they got. Um, and there was a big controversy about it, and that would be fun to discuss maybe over dinner or later, because it's, it's a funny place, um, and they're funny people. But they're, 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 European, they're Europeans, so what? Yes, Jeff. Well, yes and no. So the Human Brain Project was Henry Markram's baby, and Henry got in all kinds of trouble with Alex Pouget, Peter Diane, uh, all the people we trained with. Tony, maybe no, Tony Zader is in the U.S. Uh, Manan, Zach Manan, and uh, there was a public letter in Nature 
I, I, I always would rather talk about gossip than talk about science, so you'll have to stop me at some point. But so he got in all kinds of trouble, and he basically got kicked out of his own grant, uh, mostly because he seemed like he was trying to hoard everything to himself. <clears throat> so now the latest paper to come out, which uh, I, I mentioned to you earlier, came out with one of uh, Henry's lieutenants as the senior author, Felix Sher Sherman. And uh, Henry's not on it. Um, it says that the issue of how neurons work is just a throwaway sentence, but they, they seem to feel the issue of how neurons work is basically settled, so they don't have to worry about that. Landis Dex is on it. And so it's gone completely away from what Henry wanted. Meanwhile, Henry is still extremely well supported by the Blue Brain Project, which is IBM and Switzerland, which turns out to be a very wealthy country, and uh, Lausanne, the, the state of Lausanne. So he's very well funded, but he's kind of pulled his data and his work back away from the human brain. Oh, I, could go, I could go on. All right, so layering of inputs. This is, I find, very interesting, the idea that different inputs come from other parts of the brain into different layers. You'll notice that this looks very different than what you may have seen or thought about previously in the context of learning about the visual cortex or even somatosensory cortex. Uh, in particular, we show here no layer four. In fact, Gordon Shepard has now demonstrated there is a layer four, but it's very thin. Um, and even layer two, three is pretty small. Layer one is pretty small. Everything is layer five. And these would be grossly considered the output layers. So grossly, sensory cortex, like visual, has very strong layer two, three, layer four input areas, <coughs> input layers. And motor has very strong output. But really, they, they are somewhat homologous. And they do have the same, what, what was, has been called the canonical model of inputs through layer four. Here just showed as layer 5a into layer 2, 3, layer 2, 3 into layer 5. So that's what's called the canonical model from Douglas and Martin in their analysis of the visual cortex. So we can just put details on this. We can say, OK, here are inputs from the thalamus uh, recorded using, uh, in this case, s crackum, which I can never remember what it stands for, so I wrote it down here, subcellular channel rhodopsin-assisted circuit mapping, other connectivity worked out with laser scanning photostimulation. Uh, so th these are very sophisticated techniques, many developed by Carol Svoboda, uh, some developed by Gordon Shepard himself in terms of understanding where inputs come into, into the dendritic tree. And so uh, then we can lay it out on our model dendritic trees, and we can talk about the density of thalamic inputs into different locations. And we could then subsequently run simulations and talk about how the dynamics relates to how that layout shows up. Um, so this, again, this notion of the canonical model came from those guys. And uh, additional factors, which seem to be important in the idea of generally by stratification, stuff above layer four, or in the case of motor cortex, maybe including upper layer 5A, are somewhat different from the lower layers. And lower six, which is uh, corticothalamic cells, remains a mystery. Layer one remains such a mystery that as of now, as of this model, we had no cells in it. We have now put some cells in it. We're trying to try to understand better what's going on there. But it's, it's got to be important. And it actually happens to also be the place you see if you just pull some skull and dura off and try to record, that's, you're looking at layer one. So that's maybe even important from a technical point of view of what you can record. A, a funny feature, which uh, Gordon Shepard determined, uh, also a Japanese group determined this, is that the cortico, so-called corticostriatal cells, also called the intratelencephalic cells, project one-way circuit to the pyramidal type cells, also called corticospinal cells. So this is like the, we think, we imagine, the output circuit of brain. And this is true even for visual cortex. And you don't even think, well, visual cortex, of course, is not corticospinal. It doesn't project down to the spinal cord, as far as anyone knows. It does project to the brainstem. It projects to the superior colliculus in particular. So it has this down, this influence down to the lower areas. Uh, there are several inhibitory subpopulations that are getting more and more into that, including neuroglioform, and that's really what's going on seemingly in layer one, and also speaks to this issue of which is more important, your rotten butter or your mommy, to think about, to think about thinking. 
Uh, okay, so uh, we, this is our model. These are the cells that we include. This is the size of the model. These are the layers. One thing we emphasize, because Gordon Shepard emphasizes it, is that we want to kind of get away from classical layer thinking and just talk about locations of cells because it's, you know, everything's kind of vague. Where's layer 5A stop and layer 5B begin? We have already subdivided layer 5B into layer 5B one, uh, top versus layer 5B lower, but now it looks like there's a further subdivision there. And so there's a, all these subdivisions, so you're just safer saying, okay, how far away a normalized coordinates are you between the PIA and the white matter. Some of the cells, which we are assuming are particularly important, particularly this PT cell, corticospinal cell, and this IT, intratelencephalic corticostriatal cell, are represented in full multi-compartment uh, glory, whereas other cells are given rather short shrift because we don't have good traces and because we can't run everything at full size uh, with the amount of computer power we have. And with some tweaking and some uh, machine learning, really, genetic algorithms, we can generate a reasonable looking raster plot. So a raster plot is every dot is a spike of a cell. The cells are represented here by layer and also by cell type. So these are inhibitory cells of layer two, layer two, three, rather. Somatostatin cells, parval, sorry, these are not inhibitory. These are the excitatory cells of layer two. Uh, intratelencephalic, somatostatin, parvalbumin, the layer four cells. I mentioned before that this is a motor cortex, but it does have a layer four, uh, et cetera, down to the corticothalamic cells of layer six. Uh, one sees an emergent oscillation, usually something in the gamma range. This is very typical for these high dimensional dynamical systems. It's kind of hard not to get an oscillation unless you just get latch up or you get zero. Uh, and that's emergent in the sense that the individual cells are not firing at that rate, but as a population, you see that kind of an oscillatory activity. So here's the emergent gamma in the faux LFP, the simulated LFP. We can pull it apart to show that there's a delta wave there, and there's also this uh, high beta, high gamma. One thing that we found in the simulation uh, which is described, uh, so one thing that's well described is theta or delta modulated gamma amplitude. So the strength of the gamma, this is the frequency, 30 to 40 hertz is high beta, low gamma. This is time axis. The color is the strength. The strength kind of waxes and wanes with this delta. But in addition to that, what we found in the simulation was that the frequency so it varies. So you have delta modulated gamma frequency, which was kind of cool and something we hadn't really read much about, but it apparently does is seen sometimes and may or may not have some implications for things going, you know, switching off at a delta frequency, which is, delta frequency is nice because it's kind of the speed of thought, or maybe half of a delta is the speed of thought, a delta half wave. Uh, we can do LFPs by location. We can also do what an LFP would look like if you could identify an LFP by population. And one thing that's nice there is now we can demonstrate the canonical anatomical model, the structural model that's been demonstrated in all these brain areas by looking at dynamics and using, uh, it's a weak measure, and uh, certainly one can argue it's, it's not that reliable, but it works here, so I'm <laughs> content with it, Granger causality. I, well, I said it, there I said it. So uh, either using it with LFP or with this population. So with the population we can see, um, sorry, this is just, this is just power. Okay, next we get to Granger causality, dissect the dynamics, cross populations. We can see that the, the canonical projections such as layer four, layer two, three, do have activity uh, of information transfer, at here it's something like a gamma frequency. And s even more pronounced would be this red line, which is layer three to layer five, which is the second step of the canonical model. So this relates, not function, but at least dynamics to structure. So we have this relationship here that we can demonstrate. Can we go back one slide? Mm -hmm. Well, generally, somewhat arbitrarily, the big, the big cells, we 
say, are the big contributors, which are mostly the excitatory cells. And we generally leave out the inhibitory cells because they don't have the big antennas. So we use the antennas mostly. But something like a Martinotti cell, we could you know, easily add it in because it does have this big piece. We could add it in if we put in the details of the dendrites, which is we don't have. <coughs> the number, we don't get a number that means much. Although for the purposes of what Stephanie Jones is doing, I mean, they are trying to directly compare to MEG and, L and EEG. So they do put some number on it. But yeah, it's probably more normal. <laughs> Okay. Uh huh. I mean, you can put numbers on it because you have specific currents, you have specific dipoles. Uh, there's, we use a relatively simple algorithm, and I'd have to look at the details of that. The other one is LF pi by Gauta Einavol. He has a, 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 I think, a more sophisticated algorithm, but he generally can only run it on one cell at a time, so he doesn't generate the whole population. Um, so we can look then at different uh, inputs. In this case, also considering some neuromodulation. And this is nominally our norepinephrine neuromodulation, although it's an embarrassment to come to a norepinephrine place and talk about norepinephrine that's only being expressed as a change in IH in cortico spinal cells, because of course there's a ton more going on. So I don't want to make too much of it being norepinephrine, so we'll just talk about high IH and low IH. And uh, we stimulate at one location here, this uh, kind of super granular location or superficial location, and we see a response so that you can see where the stimulation is here. And uh, the cells respond by going, particularly L5V, it's the output cells having some degree of increased oscillation as well as increased amplitude of activity, particularly in the case of low IH. So you have this interplay of neuromodulators here very grossly represented and dynamics, different inputs, different locations of inputs, different locations of outputs being expressed because, of course, the, uh, the layer 5A, IT5A cells also respond, and those are predicting contralaterally to corticostriatum, uh, to striatal, striatal areas as well as to uh, contralateral cortex. <clears throat> so here's just showing a somewhat different pattern, really more robust pattern with the deep stimulation. Not too surprising, it's more robust because the stimulation here is in directly into the layer 5B, so these layer 5B cells respond, particularly in the case of low high H, very strongly. One thing that surprised us, we measured our LFPs at intervals of 100 microns, and we found a very different response of upper layer 5B to, to lower layer 5B. And so we were going to, in our paper, in fact, we have in our paper, made the prediction that there would be a difference in the cells of these two Sublayers, sub sublayers. They were already sublayered by calling it A and B. So uh, we, we had this nice prediction, which unfortunately the, this paper hasn't come out yet. In fact, I think it may be submitted like this week. <laughs> um, but uh, so now it hasn't come out, it hasn't even got in. Uh, we made this prediction, and I thought it was a great prediction, and then we got scooped by people who actually do work. So that's the problem with competing with people who actually do stuff. It's not fair. We do nothing. We should get credit for that, right? This is a Svoboda paper in Nature, fairly recently, where he showed very convincingly these two cell types, upper layer 5B and lower layer 5B. So now what we had as a prediction suddenly became a post-diction, and that's less cool. What can you do? Nobody would have believed this anyway until Svoboda came and did something like this, but then it would have been cool. <laughs> Post-diction wrong is really terrible. That's embarrassing. That's just because I can't, just because I didn't read the paper carefully enough, which has been known to happen. Okay, let's go. Move on. Um, all right. So now we're getting to philosophy. We're thinking about what we're, how we're going to do this problem. So now we're getting to the problem level of David Marr. And there's just all these different ways of doing this stuff. And really, the way you choose to do your computational neuroscience has more to do with how you were brought up 
than it does with the intellectual value of the work itself. Um, frankly, I was brought up, I mean, I, not like I didn't do math. I went to high school, sure. Uh, I even, you know, did like honors math in college, but I can't do math the way he can do math, or much less Peter Diane. So I'm not going to be attracted to doing these mathy sorts of solutions. And so I have come to the conclusion that they're not very worthwhile. Is that fair? Maybe not. Um, anyway, it's just these different views. So bottom up, most bottom up of these biophysicists, they want to do a single channel, they want to do the Markov model of the channel, and they really work it out. But where can you get with that? You're not going to get from very close to thought from a single uh, you know, um, a, a patch clamp of an ion channel. Now here we get something a little more mathy is these top-down, low-dimensional guys, somebody like Krishna Shinoy, he's a, more an engineer than a mathematician, maybe somebody like Peter Diane. Um, and so just you know, talk about a couple of scalars and how they interact and how they determine how we think. And I mean, they, they get great results. You can't complain. I mean, geez, Reed gets great results. I'm just sucking up to you here. But yeah, you guys get great results. So that's cool. But uh, I don't think you can really get the context of where this is all coming from in the brain or how, for example, drugs would affect it when you get to a medical condition from just doing that. I'm, I'm quite clear you can't. Uh, even more severe, uh, and uh, something like analytic theory, where you're working on the lemmas of theories. And, oh, geez. Again, stuff, stuff I don't understand. So uh, then we get all the deep learning guys, and they've like taking over because they do such cool stuff. But they're really doing a problem that, to my mind, is entirely different than the problem the brain is doing. They are doing raw perception of a go board or uh, pictures of cats or uh, chess. They are just given this, and then they, they, they work with it, and they can just do raw perception. We never do raw perception. Everything we do is motivated and dictated by, in the case of vision, extraocular movements, saccades. We look at something, and we decide what do we have to look at next. We have to obtain information. And frankly, most of the information we obtain, we have to figure out to throw out, because it's not any use to us. So we're not trying to be perfect information uh, channels, which I saw that as, a, a, as an assumption in, in our paper recently, how do you develop a perfect information channel? We have to be as imperfect as possible and still get something useful back. So we have to decide what to get, we have to try to get it, and if we, uh, Bayes, Bayesian prior, that's fine, we have Bayesian priors, we know what we need to get, and if we get it, we work with it, if we don't, we have some kind of a oddball and we have to make maybe some adjustments. Uh, and we have to throw out most of everything we see. So uh, if in terms of thinking about consciousness and thinking about learning, I'm very much a motor-driven guy. You've got to go out there and get it. You don't just sit around waiting for somebody to show you a picture of a cat, unless you're like looking at cats on the internet, then what else do you do, right? Um, and so we believe, this is what uh, Reed said earlier, middle-out, multi-scale modeling. We want to do something about the problem, think about the problems that the brain faces, and also think about all the pieces that have to do solutions to that problem. Uh, in particular, because I am a clinician, I think about things like epilepsy. And this is a, a really old notion came from uh, William Lennox uh, in the 50s, 40s and 50s. The river of epilepsy. That epilepsy is not caused by ever, really, by one thing. It's always caused by a bunch of little things going wrong. And so if you're it's going to say, well, what's the, you know, where's the magic bullet? Where's the penicillin for epilepsy? By and large, you're not going to be able to find it, except there may be a few rare single mutation cases. You really have to be treating the whole patient, and you also have to be treating the whole set of problems that cause it. Uh, here is this scale picture. Uh, space on the y-axis, time on the x-axis, logarithmic, logarithmic, from the tiny to the big from the little, little time to the long, long time. And all of these systems are in something of a sequence, as one could do with any organ system. You could do this with the liver or the kidney. But I think what's kind of interesting about the brain, which is probably less true of the liver or the kidney, is this overlap. And so we talked about dendrites. I'm a big fan of dendrites. You've got these big antennas, these big pickups, running through multiple layers of network. So this is a subcellular scale. The dendrite's a subcellular piece. 
and it is interacting dynamically all the time with the network. And so you can't say, oh, we're just going to pull out the single cell, and we're going to reduce it to its basic functionality. And having reduced it, we can now put it back in and say, OK, now how's the network work? Well, the network works, in my guess, by making use of the dynamics of these complex entities that are subcellular. So in particular, we try to have show this overlap here between dendrite layer, cell and column layer, and even maybe we should put the local circuit even down in there. We should have. All right, I'll do that next time I make this. That's a key point. So, so we do face a lot of objections to detailed modeling, so I thought I'd say a little about that. We are not, we are not, Occam, we're not Occamizable. Uh, we um, do not reduce things to the simplest model. Um, and it, you know, statistics does reduce things to a simple model. You can have a million points of data and reduce it to a regression coefficient. And so suddenly you've got the answer in a scalar to something that's very complex. And that's because the things that are com the complexity is coming from having so much of that stuff, or like statistical mechanics. You reduce things to thermodynamics. You have so much of that stuff, but all those things are the same. Whereas in a 747, or in a brain, or even in a kidney or a liver, there's so many different entities at so many different scales. There are things like nuclear pores, which I don't even think about, that have all this clever engineering. And how does it all work? And Occam is not going to tell you how, not to mention he's been dead for like a millennium. He's not going to tell you. And similarly, Popper, Popper, well, these models, these complex models are not falsifiable. Yes, your 747 will occasionally crash, or more than likely a 737, but that doesn't mean you've falsified your model of flight. You have this complexity, and you've actually gotten a lot of things out of your engineering and out of your understanding of this system that, that basically works. Um, and there are pieces that need to be fixed. So it's not like physics. It's not falsifiable. Uh, we are not doing curve fitting, although we do have uh, a curve fitting algorithm. But uh, a lot of our parameters are at least moderately well fixed. Certainly the capacitance of the cell membrane is pretty well fixed. Some of the conductances in the soma are well fixed. The reason we don't understand anything practically about the dendrites is because the conductances of the dendrites are not yet well fixed. So if I had to if I could work with somebody who's figured out a way of doing that, that would be where I would look for answers to how the brain works, is how the dendrites work, which I already mentioned, but really, what are these conductance densities? Because given those conductance densities, we can build models then that will help us understand. And so Marr, uh, to come back to him, this was David Marr in the 70s. He died young, unfortunately. He wrote some very influential books. Uh, one entitled Vision really goes into this issue of what's the problem the brain has? How are the algorithms going to work? And then forget, the implementation is not important. You can do it in silicon. You can do it in carbon. You can do it in polonium. I don't know. Anything. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, I think that's wrong. So I'm into looking at the implementation problem and then going middle in towards algorithm. An example of the problem of vision, Mar says, OK, it's all about <coughs> reducing this two-dimensional retinal image to three dimensions. Well, that's not what it's about at all. I mean, first of all, he ignores the motor aspect, which is that you're really going for things. I mentioned that earlier. The other thing that he would never have predicted, nobody would have predicted, is that you have a ventral pathway and a dorsal pathway. You have a what pathway and a where pathway. Well, that's no, no way to run a brain. Nobody, no engineer would design it that way except for God, and he's so good at stuff, you can't, you know, can't beat him. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's really remarkable that, well, this is the way we, the brain actually works. And this is a clue as to how you might want to engineer a system. But before this came up, nobody would engineer a system. We're going to make half the system work on motion, and the other half the system work on shapes. And we're going to sometimes, as can be demonstrated by Treisman and others, have failures so that we think that something is moving is not actually what's moving. Wait. Oh. Yeah. yeah. All right.
way you come in. So let me just say two things. First, we may start by defending Marx a little bit by blurring it out. Okay. So, I mean, there are parts of thinking about the kinds of problems, like what and where are visual designations, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, no, it's important, but you wouldn't have come up with those problems. Yeah. Right. Okay. If you were designing a raccoon, if you were thinking, I'm going to design a raccoon, and the plane is a good example, so let's go there. Okay. So in the case of the plane, even, I just want you to take on the flexibility and word detail. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you can build a plane out of a sheet of paper. Yeah. And it has a lot of the features of the plane, maybe not very well controllable once you let go of it, but it'll fly. Mm-hmm. Bernoulli. Yeah. Yeah. It solves you know, fluid flow and lift problem, and the, the engine just doesn't have to go with it, so it only flies for a little bit. Right. You wouldn't care at all that it was made out of a particular kind of paper. Right. Okay, how do you know that? Okay, so, so even if you were modeling this plane here, you would use um, computational sort of dynamic model. But you wouldn't immediately go all the way down to atoms and the, uh, whatever form the room. Well, you would, you would, that you would, because the problem that they had when they developed even non-powered flight was to get the control surfaces right, and that was the Wright brothers' great contribution. Well, we're still doing that, right? Yeah, with, uh, with 737. Water, <laughs> seven, I mean, 747 got pretty darn, and yeah. the surfaces have gotten pretty darn good. But as you improve it, if it, if it doesn't have enough lift, then it doesn't work as much. No, you need that basic stuff. And or, And, rel well, and relative, relative to what the pilots can accommodate That's right. fast enough. Yeah. 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 So I'm just saying, though, that if you were designing a raccoon, you would want to Well, I mean, physics is not done because we still have dark matter. We have no idea what it is. We still have string theory. Might be right. But none of that's going to help us with the problems we face here. The parts of uh, statistical mechanics and fluid flow and uh, 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 <coughs> uh, motion of, of particles uh, is, is handled. And all the little bits are mostly handled, I think. And so now we can start to put them together. So yeah, until you had Bernoulli, you couldn't get started. But once you had Bernoulli, then you could think, well, what's the biology? And that's, again, the Wright brothers' contribution is look at birds. And uh, of course, Langley. Langley was, OK, it's like a boat, basically. We'll put a rudder on it, and it'll launch it, and it'll fly, and we'll just move the rudder, and it'll go back and forth. Well, none of that worked at all. It just crashed into the, Langley was the Smithsonian guy. He was, he was very famous. He was very well funded. He was, uh, and he just uh, made assumptions. The boat and it just crashed immediately. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay, so wait, so I appreciate the challenges that you're asking. Um, and I guess you're saying nobody's really solving them. We don't really have enough of these now. Wait. No, I'm not gonna I'm not ready to throw in the nuclear poor, for God's sake, but I think you have to know what that's the cells, I mean, I think Cajal was right, Golgi was wrong, it's not a sensation, the cells do something. The cells happen to send information to each other in the form of spikes, and this is part of, I think, the next slide maybe, the spike, what's the code, what's the neural code? Well, somehow, these cells are designed in some way that they can identify the neural code. If I have to use, as I do, Shannon information theory to try to pull out pieces of code, I'm really way behind. Not behind only in real time, which is behind in terms of be, having enough computing power to get there. So uh, people are, are wandering out. Maybe I should move it forward because I have like 50 more slides to show. You guys don't mind being here till midnight, right? Good. Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> information, information theory. Most of what we do is going to be information for us as experimentalists, and not information that the animal is necessarily using. I tend to think maybe the brain is not noisy. Another discussion, another set of arguments. 
Skip it. Moving on. Codes, many codes, they're all coexisting. The one that I like particularly is Simon Thorpe's first wave code. Fouget worked with Simon Thorpe before. And this is the idea that when you see that tiger, or shark for that matter, you've got to respond pretty damn quickly. You've got to like identify that and make your move before you are eaten, not after. Um, and so there's got to be this code there. You've got to do things in 100 milliseconds. That's the time you might have. Because the guy who's trying to kill you is doing things in 100 milliseconds, so you don't have much time. And then you have all these other codes because you're doing things after that. You're, and you're also even doing things all the way up to thinking about playing Go and chess. Uh, so multiplexing on top of multiplexing, multiplexing roots, multiplexing codes, multiplexing within codes, multiplexing ensembles. The hedgehog and the fox, Isaiah Berlin, the idea that the hedgehog knows one big, here's another A philosopher from the Greeks, uh, hedgehog knows one big thing, and you know that's not going to be true for the brain. The brain does not do one big thing or know one big thing. It has all these tricks and so many ways of doing things. So just briefly, this idea that I've been developing with Surgeon Antic at University of Connecticut of an ensemble within an ensemble, and he works a lot in SLICE on NMDA plateaus, and he can identify, get these plateaus to come up in basilar dendrites and in apical obliques. And they'll last for as much as 200 to 400 milliseconds. And he does this Gevy's uh, genetically encoded voltage indicators, as well as calcium indicators, to show that they are coming from these dendrites, and then they are strong enough to activate the soma for periods of over 100 milliseconds. So somewhat distinguishable from what's called NMDA spikes which only lasts order 30 to 40 milliseconds. You increase the glutagate stimulus, you don't get bigger plateaus, you get longer plateaus. And this is, uh, again, from data, and then we can simulate that to show how you can get longer and longer plateaus. So our simulations uh, are making the assumption that there's some extrasynaptic activation, that's not important. We, stim we can get them in multiple dendrites, and so here are experiment, here are simulation showing that we can uh, really get different, even different types of plateaus, which are slightly different morphologies based on different models, actually, of the NMDA synaptic conductance itself. Uh, and we can get responses that are comparable in terms of re responsivity to TTX, blocking of sodium channel. Uh, we can also get comparable responses in terms of the back propagation of action potentials from the axon initial helix and the soma into these basilar dendrites, both during and without plateaus. This is a ready population? This is ready. And so that's, we get to our theory. We're ready to go. We're activated. And now, uh, again, a few more slides of uh, the, the phenomenology. Once you have this ready population, these guys can spike. So an EPSP, a compound EPSP that could not cause a spike without the plateau will now cause spikes in the setting of the plateau. And uh, we can take this and talk about now embedded ensembles. So our notion is the embedded ensemble encoding theory, that you have the ready population, which could be a Bayesian prior of an ensemble that might be activatable by stuff coming in from the sensory world in such a way as to give you a message of correspondence through synchrony of activated Spikes. So that's the basic idea. You have the plateau, clustered inputs gives you the plateau, and then other inputs can give you the individual spike. So it's an ensemble of prepared cells, an ensemble of activated cells. You know, chance favors a prepared cell, and then the other inputs give you activation of a spike. Embedded ensembles. That's the theme. It's gumball. It's all gumball. And this is still very weak network simulations. So here, this local input gives the plateau, and then on top of the plateau, you have activated action potentials that can be synchronous and then could be read out in the context of something like a Lisman model of gamma on theta, or just a pure synchrony model without any underlying oscillation being necessary, except for the oscillation of the plateau itself, which is order, uh, potentially order half of a uh, delta. So my key thing is, where do we get the decoder ring? We used to be able to get it from Cracker Jacks, but Cracker Jacks no longer gives prizes. Did you know that? I haven't bought it in so long. They don't give prizes. So you have to go to Amazon and get decoder rings made of silver. 
for like $200. And I used to get it for free. So this is why I've made so little progress, because damn decoder rings are so expensive. So it's work's actually done by people, uh, and in particular, Salvador has done a lot of this work. Uh, Sam Lee Moten did this work, but I think his kid got sick, so he missed this dinner. Uh, who else did a lot of the work? Mateo here is doing that GUI I talked about. There's actually another table of people. We all, we're a, a, a computational lab, so we actually never see each other because we're all computer geeks and we can't bear face-to-face -face interaction. So we only communicate through Slack, and we have a dinner once a year because if there's food, they'll come. They still won't talk, but they'll come. And so that, that's why there's this picture. And so uh, who else was important here? Sam Nemoten was very important, I mentioned. Uh, Mohammed. Important. They're all important. Everybody's important. It's a, everybody gets a participation trophy. Okay, so uh, questions? Or, yes, thank you. Yes. The plateau will go off uh, after a certain amount of time. Either you can, you can throw input, uh, inhibitory input into it, and that will turn it off, or the NMDA uh, activation duration. And so we are hypothesizing two different kinds of NMDA based on these two different types of, uh, uh, of morphologies of the plateaus. And they have different Markov model properties. One comes, is a very simple one from Melinda Stex, in fact. The other one's a much more complicated one from Guy Major. And so we really tried all kinds of things to get the two morphologies and came down to this difference. That's our prediction that these are different isof isoforms of, of the plateau, but mostly inactivation. In the slice, in the slice experiment? All slice. There's evidence from in vivo. They, they, they turned off spontaneously. Right. Well, the other thing is uptake of glutamate. So as long as you have glutamate occupancy, you have less inactivation than once the glutamate goes away. So one hypothesis of surgeon, surgeon antics, is that you have, uh, you're overwhelming the capacity of the astrocytes to take up the glutamate. Well, if, if, if he does it with an electrode that's just administering a shoot load of, of but uh, the idea is, if you have the clustering, and there's some anatomical evidence of this clustering, and you had this set of presynaptic cells going off at the same time because they are encoding something, then this cell is going to be activated. And so one ensemble comes up with ready, and spikes with that So, you know, it, it can be shifting, but these are all, presumably the cells are playing all the roles so that a set of cells is projecting as a input to get spiking in a set of prepared cells, but at the same time can be projecting to another set of cells to prepare those cells ahead of time. So you can imagine a little cycle of, of that with... A lot of energy. The nervous system is really very... Well, I mean, I it's, it's, like right, yes. That but you have to get so depolarized to get some spikes. I mean, up and down states also require a lot. The up states require a lot of energy. You have to be up there if you want to be spiking. And well, that's another point I like to make, and I will make now, that uh, you know, people talk about oscillations being epiphenomenal. Well, they are epiphenomenal. It's just an indication that we can read out, and yet, despite being epiphenomenal, there's something going on there, we think, at that frequency. Well, I would argue that rate coding is also epiphenomenal. You have rate. The cells are spiking. OK, of course, we know there's some information being conveyed when the cells are spiking. There's no information being conveyed when the cells are not spiking. So they're spiking. That is already, I would call it, an envelope. And in there, you have any number of possibilities for how you're making use of those spikes. Just, just ask okay, some embarrassingly we'll simple we'll question, because those I can answer usually. It's called mercy question. Mercy question. No, no, he's, he's always tough on me. Okay. There's nothing wrong with that. It's okay. But the overall goal of this entire issue is to get funding. Oh, no, sorry. Go on. What were you saying? Is, 
Yeah. We just talked about glial reuptake of glutamate. That's critical. Right. We would like to model that. Yes. So, uh, so those, uh, I guess, what information, how does that fit into a model like something like a tension study or like some, some, some less mechanical uh, uh, training for activity and so forth? It's like, you know, other than a mesh, for example, or just a generic set. Yeah, there's a, there's a hypothesis from Chen, I think, Roger Chen, C-S-I-E-N, about uh, making use of extracellular matrix as a place for really long-term storage of memory because that stuff stays there, and you can then put your synapses there, and you won't lose them as you would with LTP or something like that. Well, again, all this stuff is hypothesis. I mean, the leading hypothesis remains rate coding and, practically speaking, deep learning, which means distributed ensembles, which I think, I, I agree with distributed ensembles. I don't agree with rate coding. So it's OK to have an unsupported hypothesis because there are no well-supported hypotheses out there yet, except at these lower levels. Hodgkin and Huxley did a great thing. but that And that's what we're still kind of basing a lot of our thinking on, and that was whatever, 70 years ago. Cajal did a great thing a century and a quarter ago. And so these guys are a while back. Yeah, but there's no, uh, we don't have a model. If I were going to store, if I were going to design, I'd put most of the stuff in a different spot in the computing set. Uh, yeah. Store long term in the computer lab. Nobody's had a, there's not been a breakthrough. There's not been anything like a decoding breakthrough in the nervous system that rivals um, understanding DNA. DNA. Well, that's what Crick was going to do, and then he, he died young, only 80 or something, so 88. Okay, <laughs> so too bad. Minority of efforts that go on that try to deal with the overwhelming amount of detail in there. But does it does it work? I mean, it works. I mean, you know, for example, will the Bruce Allen is the the best Allen that we can get of a civil system. Anyway, but in twenty minutes, we're running around. ready to go. Yeah, I mean, Henry Markham was the other guy working on this, but he never wanted to cooperate with anybody, and he, even with us, people who believed in what he did. So right. it's unfortunate. So there's really not that many groups that are doing it still. Now, and there's, and, and uh, I think you're striking at something, which is that this is a team sport. And um, more like a league sport. Multiple teams need to figure out ways to cooperate. So even just thinking about structuring brain science at the sort of meta level, what can and can't be important. Like, I can't imagine a single group doing, other than, <coughs> you know, other than stumbling on something like, for example, most can always get lucky. Or if that's a good distinction at all. No, in the, in the brain, it's not probably. Um, well, I, I don't know. Behavior is a little bit like thought, right? Like some sort of group control. Mm -hmm. There's conditions. It's a whole literature on conditioning where you can extract real. You know, this is probably implemented in different mm -hmm. ways. Okay. The idea of C is a kind of behavioral fictional for I C, but I C work in lots of different ways. They solve the same sort of generic problem. Okay. I do appreciate your comment. Of doom. Okay. Thanks again.
Thank you.